Men, it is hard enough for us to be vulnerable. It is worse for it to be thrown in our faces. Right. So with these men who come to me and they're like, I, and they'll just tell me, told her. And I didn't really want to, but I felt really comfortable at that time. We were sitting there, we're talking. She had just told me about something that happened to her. And I felt really comfortable. And I'm like, this, this is my girl. We about, to, we about to do big things. Let me let her in on something. So he'll let her in about this moment. Or he'll let her in about this, about this business opportunity, about this dream that he has, something he wants to do. That while it may sound stupid to somebody else, it should sound amazing to my girl because that's my girl. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, wow, baby, I can't believe you're going to do that. And what's the plan? And then th four months later, and that's why that business plan didn't work because it was dumb because you blah, blah, blah. And it's, mm -hmm. you, might, you, might as well just get, you might as well just move because you lost that man. You may have the body, but you lost his soul. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey, friends, my name is Whitney, and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney. I'm your host, and I'm here today with Harvey Laguerre. And I'm super excited for this conversation because it's not every day that you get to talk to Black men about mental health. And so we're going to jump in and see where the conversation takes us. Um, Harvey is the host of Men Are the Prize podcast, which is a great podcast. I highly suggest folks listen to it, whether you identify as male or not, because for me, it gives me a lot of insight as to how men process things. Um, and so I find it really fascinating. So Harvey, can you introduce yourself? Let us know what identities you bring to this conversation. So Harvey Laguerre is the name, 49 years old, as you can see if you're watching in the gray. My experience, my life is in my is on my chin. Um, I am a stay-at-home father of four, uh, a 19-year-old son, 17-year-old daughter, 14-year-old daughter, nine-year-old daughter. So as I tell people, I'm tired. I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Them kids keep me up and about. I am a Black man trying to stay upright and positive and alive in this world. And what you said is you don't typically hear Black men talking about mental health. That's why I host the podcast called Men of the Prize, because we don't typically talk about mental health, especially Black men. I think a lot of us don't think we have time for it. I think we've got so many other things to do. I heard, I saw somewhere recently where 50 Cent said that a depression is, is what did he say? Something really dumb. Um, uh, excuse me. Is a privilege. Oh, to, Lord. He, so apparently, and I, I might be misquoting him and not that he's going to hear this. Um, and maybe he will. Maybe he's a fan. But he's not going to care what I have to say. But apparently to him, the idea of having some kind of mental health issue is a privilege. And I disagree wholeheartedly with mm. that. We Black men, a lot of the things that hold us back from succeeding as entrepreneurs, as husbands, as fathers have a lot to do with past traumas, with how we were raised, with situations that we had to deal with and we didn't know how, with not being told that it was okay to cry when something bad happens, when we weren't told to ask for that hug because we really just needed to release something, when we're not told that maybe writing out the feeling we have will help us in dealing with it, you know, instead of dealing with it in a negative way. Mental health is not discussed with us. so. I'm sure it's something we will talk about, but mental health was never brought up to me, ever. Nobody ever said, hey, I know that girl you liked in high school and she wasn't interested in you and she wouldn't even talk to you. How'd you feel about that? How, where is your self-esteem? Where's your confidence? Nobody said that to me, nobody. Um, you know, you wanted that promotion. You didn't get it. How do you feel about that? It was, oh, that happened? As Jay-Z would say, you know, Wipe off that dirt and keep it moving. That's how we're raised, to just keep it moving. And sometimes it's better to stop and deal with the situations instead of keeping it moving. So I come to you as a human 
trying to do my best in this world, understanding that sometimes I need to stop, process what's happening. I'm a man who's trying every day to figure out exactly what it means to be a man while trying to figure out if the things I'm doing are masculine, mm. while trying to figure out what to do to raise my daughters properly, trying to raise my son properly, still growing myself. We have so much as men, so many things we have to deal with and we don't deal with them. We just keep it moving. Yeah. I want to say you have my husband's dream life. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. You don't know about this. <laughs> he, his dream is to be a stay at home dad. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it's for love of the kids or if it's, he thinks it'll be easy, which as the primary parent, that ain't the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause I definitely don't want to be a stay at home mom. <laughs> mm -mm. No, thank you. That's not my calling. Mm -hmm. um, so you are also of Haitian descent, correct? I am. Yes. My parents born in Haiti and then came here, obviously, to have the better life. And um, I come from a large Haitian family. So they came together. And for a long time, I have 12 aunts and uncles. Oh, wow. And they and they came in groups and they lived together and they went to school and they worked. You come to America with this expectation. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they didn't see The Godfather where everybody's on the boat and you see Ellis Island and everybody. They didn't see that. But America has this. There's this idea. We come here and you're going to, you know, the American dream and you're going to live life and your, your family is going to be taking care of a house, two and a half kids, picket fence, all that stuff. They just wanted to come here and be able to live more comfortably because if you know the history of haiti and even now as we record it's just chaos out there and it's just you have to get out of there and even with the unrest that's in haiti there's still this certain level of class that we carry we're from haitian i'm proud of my island i mean i'd be proud of its history all the time but i'm proud that i'm haitian so they wanted to come to america and be haitian in america Mm -hmm. raise our kids and work. So they came here and they all went to school and my dad went to college and he's an accountant and my mom came here and she's a nurse. And the idea was to have the American dream and we bring our culture and everybody does that. But when Haitians come, they bring their culture. Education is incredibly important. And I, I, didn't, I grew up being Haitian and not really realizing it because I was just growing up. I'm just mm. here. I don't, the idea of being Haitian is not something that I really thought of. But things like the food, like Haitian food is, you know, give me some rice. You know, a lot of people may not know about Haitian food, but they know about the mushroom rice, du jean jean that we call it. There's stuff about being Haitian that's amazing. The food is amazing. Our music is so energizing. You know, it's compa. We, we just, there's something about it. And the, the music never really hit me, but I know the music when I hear it. And that's part of my culture. <laughs> and and there's little things, little things that I caught up that I didn't really recognize until I became a parent. The idea of somebody, of a child like whistling is like, what are you doing? Like, it just brings up this anger. Like if you whistle and I'm like, I didn't understand that as a kid, but one of my kids whistle. I'm like, what are you doing? What, stop that, that noise. It just feels weird. Um, <laughs> there's really little things. Like if you cross your arms like this, it's like, were you trying to fight? Like you, you want to go? Like there's this aggression. Yeah. There's little things that we pick up that, that you pick up once you're in a different position. I was a child first. Now I'm the parent. And it's little insignificant things. It doesn't matter. My child whistling is not wrong, but it feels wrong to me. And I think that's a Haitian thing. Um, we're very respectful of our parents. We're very respectful. And I think that's that might even be a Caribbean thing, that we're overly yeah. respectful of our of our parents. And we don't we there's a way to speak. You don't, you know, you don't suck you don't suck your teeth like I, you know, they're just little things mm -hmm. that we do we know better. But we are but in terms of family, we are so connected. So I grew up with a bunch of cousins where we would hang out and I we knew each other. And I went to I went to like um the learning trees, the first school I went to was like pre-K and we went together and like we lived in the same house for a while until everybody saved enough money to move into their own homes and such. And we're very connected. So they're like the tightest 
of friends that I have in the world or my cousins or my people that I still talk to. But um, I think being Haitian is being prideful, um, recognizing that there's a lot of strife in my country, but it's still my favorite country. It's still the motherland for me. It's yeah. the country is the first black country to, you know, get their own freedom. It's their stuff that we know and we'll tell you to your face. We struggle, but you know, we did this first. So yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot to being Haitian and I'm proud of it. Yeah. And I was just gonna say that one of the things that strikes me about Haitian folks that I know is the pride. And when you learn a little bit more about the history of Haiti and that it was the first black, you know, country and and who who found their liberation. And I just thinking about how that ties into who Haitian Americans are today or who, you know, just the people that I'm interacting with on a daily basis and thinking about all of the culture and the legacy that comes with them. It's really amazing to think about and holding, as you said, the turmoil that is going on in Haiti right now. I think just this morning I turned on my phone and the first things that are coming at me are out of Haiti and images that just um, are gripping. And so I imagine that that's um, a lot to hold, a lot to hold. Yeah. So you you said something in your intro that we got to talk about, and that is that nobody ever spoke to you about mental health. Right. Definitely. And my experience is different in that we spoke about mental health starting at a certain age, starting at, for me, it was around 12. Um, and that was because of trauma in my life. And then I have a relative who was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder um, shortly after that. And so we did talk about mental health, kind of. And when I say kind of, what I mean is everybody knew we were going to various therapies or we were, you know, monitoring medication intake, but there wasn't a lot of processing around it. And I'm curious what it was like for, for you as a black man, as a Haitian man, learning about mental health. Um, what was that journey as someone who growing up, there was not conversation about mental health? Now, growing up, well, being an adult male now, being a black man now, I I mentioned, obviously, we didn't have any discussion about it. And the reason it's so apparent to me that it was never spoken about is because there are so, I grew up in so many situations where it could have been spoken about, where there was an opportunity to do it. Um, because I host a podcast for men to be vulnerable, there is nothing about me that I hold back. So my parents got married a little bit before I was born. My mom was 18 when I was born, my dad a little bit older. They didn't need to be together. I grew up in quite the toxic household mm. in every way you can imagine. So I was in the house when arguments were happening, when violent arguments were happening. I could hear things breaking. I could hear people screaming. I could hear all that stuff. And when the time came for them to end that marriage, I went to court, I had to talk about who I wanted to live with, all these things. That's the first time. Okay, mm. now you are the child of divorce. First of all, this is not your fault. But if you are a child of divorce, is it me? Was I a bad kid? Is that why mommy and daddy aren't together? That's the first conversation that should have happened. Didn't happen. Um, two, let's talk about why. And I need, at that age, as a 10, 11 year old black boy, I need to know that what I was a party to, I wasn't a part of. Know what I mean? I heard it. Yeah. And what all that violence and all that stuff, that's not how a relationship is supposed to be because I grew up in that. I know no different. I know of trauma. I know of violence. I know of continuous arguments. I know of the inability to deal with conflict in a reasonable way. So basically, that's all I know. I grew up in all this stuff. That's the conversation I need to have. How do you treat a woman in your life? I need to have that conversation. 
What does it mean to be the man in the relationship? All these things, none of those conversations were had with me. I definitely needed that. What I eventually had, they divorce. I live with my dad. I am pretty much an introverted child. I'm in my house, living with my dad. I'm not really getting raised. I'm just in the house. Mm -hmm. my, first, my first mental health realization is my own. I go to college and I just went and had way too much fun. We'll leave it at that. I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I make it to class. And because of that, I came <laughs> home. I, I mean, 0.8 GPA first semester, 1.2 second. Yeah, they don't want you to come back after that. Now, but you yeah, improved. But I, I you improved. I definitely improved. That's another conversation that I never got. So the idea that I can mess up, that I can make a mistake, but it doesn't define me, mm. is a conversation. My first mental health moment is coming home. The only people who wanted me less than the college was my father when I came back after failing out. I come home, can't even look at me, cannot even look at me. You can tell when somebody's disappointed in you. You can tell when somebody really doesn't want you around. And I felt it. And since I, have, I wasn't taught how to deal, process any emotion like that, I just sat in there and for pretty much a year was like, Nobody wants me. If my father doesn't want me, who does? What do I do about that? Why would I even think anybody else would want me? So after a year of sitting in that, I tried to kill myself. Mm. And the only re it I tried, and I, I mentioned it to you before, but it's on my wrist. My scar is there because I tried. I failed. And that would have been a good time for a conversation beforehand. Afterwards. Any time after that, I had my own mental health awakening, but it took a while even after that action mm -hmm. to realize, you know what? I am not defined by the fact that I failed out once, even twice. I can still, I'm an intelligent person. There's reasons why this didn't work out the first time or the second time. There's a reason why I need to go back. I will succeed. There's a reason why I should still feel good about myself. And so my mental health awakening was of my own volition. Finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I can't do this. I'm a good person. I, will, I was just brought up in a bad situation. What do I do about it? And it took a while. It took a while because I didn't want to get married. I'm like, I may have some kids. I saw too much bad marriages. I saw too much negativity. Ooh. Why would I think that it would work for me? Yeah. And not until I met somebody who, you know, and I was very, I was very, I'm never getting married until I saw her. And then I'm like, okay, I literally was, oh, okay. That's my wife. I was, I was <laughs> like, that's it. I'm like, I'm not married. I'm not getting married. And seriously walked into work, saw her at a desk. That's my wife. And that was it. It was that simple and meeting her and we got together and it really opened me up. Because for that Ooh. point, I had like a good six, seven years where I didn't even talk to my father. I still was cool with my mom, but I didn't talk to my dad at all. And that's not a good thing because I, I carried around a lot of hate. Ooh. I carried a lot because of how we treated my mom, because of how we treated me. That's a whole nother conversation. How do I deal with all this emotion, all this weight, the weight of the world that I'm carrying? on me that is literally stopping me from doing other stuff. And I had that conversation with myself. I was like, finally, listen, I'm, I'm married. I've met this woman. When we finally got together, we were pretty quick. We hung out. It felt like I met her. We hung out and then I, and I, and then I knocked her up. She was, she was <laughs> super fast. Like it was met her on a Friday, Tuesday. She was at the top. But once we knew, we knew, right? So that's all I can say. But for me, I can't bring kids into this world like that. Yeah, I can't. I, I disliked him so much. I don't want my kids to know that. I don't want to bring that into this into this family. So you know, introduced my fiance to him, and I'm like, okay, you're about to have a grandchild. Got to forgive you for all this stuff that happened, and it felt a lot better, mm. a lot better. It's the things that we don't see that hold us back. Yeah, and that forgiveness is about us yep. healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after your suicide attempt, mm -hmm. where or how did you get the language 
and the insight that what was happening was a mental health breakdown. That if you, if we were talking about physical hygiene uh, and relating that to mental health, that your mental health hygiene was not great. Um, how did you get that language? Because I, I ask, because I think even using the words mental illness, depression, anxiety, suicide, these words are even taboo in some of the communities that we grow up with. Mm -hmm. And when we're seeking care, medical care or care from our friends and family, there's a lot of kind of backing into the fact that what we're talking about is mental wellness. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what, how you came to this realization that you know, if you were depressed, I don't know if you consider yourself depressed at that point, but like, how did you name what you were experiencing and then start to find solutions for a way to to live the life that you wanted to live? I don't know if I entirely had a name for what I felt or a name for what I was going through, but I knew something was there. And now later on, when talking about mental health is, it, I mean, I still think to a degree it is taboo. At least I know in my community, you know, you don't need a therapist. Go see, you know, go see your deacon or go see your priest or something. Oh, you know, you don't need to see a therapist. That's for crazy people. All that stuff. That's still kind of out there. For me, what I recognize is this. I am an 80s kid. I grew up in, in my opinion, the best decade for music, movies, all that good stuff. And so, and I will debate that. I have debated people who talk to me about the nineties. I'm like, you don't even understand. You, you don't know, but that's fine. So I'm, so I'm like, <laughs> and I love music. Like I love jazz. And I spent a lot of time in my room when I was just growing up because I didn't have a lot of people to talk to and whatever. So I grew up listening to, to all kinds of music. I went through my, you know, my big hair phase of Def Leppard and rock and Bon Jovi and all that. And then went into Billy Joel and then finally found R&B and jazz and blues and all that. But it may seem strange, but I started to lose that. I started yeah. to lose what I love. S music didn't do it for me as much. I'm very much that lights off, headphones on, put that music on and just listen and just kind of experience it. First time you listen to Off the Wall and I'm just like, oh my God, Michael, God, what are you doing? Who, nobody else gonna do this or Thriller or anything else. And all of a sudden I wasn't, there was nothing attracted me. The stuff that I, cause I feel like I'm an old soul and all the things about me weren't there. It's not that they were changing, it's just I couldn't find them anymore. What, what was about me, me and growing up in the 80s, and now I can just find my phone and play a song, but if you, if you are of my age, if you had that song you wanted, you had to wait till like eight o'clock when they do the top 10, and you had to play the song, and you had to record, and you try to catch it before the DJ started talking over the song, because that was annoying. Like, I'm trying to listen to this song, and this person is talking, and you know, all this stuff. And I loved all that foolishness and making my own, my own little mixes and stuff like that. That guy, was no way to be found. I'm just sitting here feeling, I don't know how, feeling this way, I don't know why. And I just like, I'm losing myself. Something is going on to the point where I don't even want to be around. Yeah. What's going on? And no, I didn't have a name for it, but I had a feeling. I didn't have a name for it, but I, but I recognized something was missing. I was missing. And when I was finally, and it took me years to even be able to say this, I just kind of lived through it. But if I, if I had language for it back then, I probably would have been a lot better off. I, would, I wouldn't have been in that situation because I would have recognized it. I would have recognized the first time I failed out that I needed to just kind of say, hey, listen, take a deep breath. What'd you do wrong? What could you have done to improve? I could have gone through my list. I could have thought about my mistakes. What could I have done to improve? I could have looked for support, but I didn't know what it was. I just knew it was bad and it just knew it wasn't me. It reminds me, or I guess maybe what I'm imagining is this feeling of the mental unwellness being you. Mm. Um, because that's how I've felt 
is that when I'm experiencing one of these moments and I still have them, even though, you know, I'm on medication, I do things to take care of myself, it it becomes almost impossible for me to remove myself from my situation. And so I have felt the fear of I'm wrong. Like there's something, not only is there something wrong with me, but like all of this, all of me is wrong. And getting the language to be able to understand the different parts of me and the mental illness and mental wellness and what was going to be required for me to take care of myself helped me to detach the me mm-hmm. from being unwell. Uh, and that was really empowering for me because then, you know, it was still obviously something that I had to deal with. But it didn't, it started to not diminish my entire worth and my entire value. And instead, it was like, okay, Whitney, you've got this thing going on and we're going to deal with this thing, but you're still there. You're still good. You're still okay. You're still a human. You're still, you know, existing and you deserve to exist and you deserve to have these feelings. It's just a matter of, processing these feelings. Mm-hmm. So what what happens next for you? After you failed out of college, you're at home, your dad doesn't want to look at you, um, you attempt to take your life and you fail, thank goodness. Mm-hmm. And then what? How do you get to the Harvey that you are today? So I make my attempt I felt that and nobody knew. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't have anybody to tell about the reason I would try. So why would I tell anybody when I tried? So I just kept dealing with life. But at that point, I was just kind of at a standstill. I was just stagnant. I'm just here. Um, I I attempt to go go back to school. I still, I went to community college. You know, I did okay there, but I was still just really depressed. So even at this point, educating myself wasn't bettering myself because I was stuck. So I may, I may have taken these classes. I may have learned this stuff, but I'm no better than I was before because I'm just so disappointed in myself, depressed about my situation. And like you said, for me at that point, what was happening was me. It was my life as opposed to a time in my life, which is that what I kind of gauge from what you're saying. It's not everything. It's just right now. Mm -hmm. And I needed to get that. And it took me a while. And eventually I just had to get out of my dad's house because I couldn't be there Mm -hmm. because there was nothing positive in there. There was, I, I need, well, the reason that I was so low is because of the lack of emotion, the lack of anything and positive emotion I was getting. I wasn't getting affirmed. I wasn't getting any of that stuff. So staying there doesn't work. And that was a strong enough thing for me. I had to go. So I went out of there. I stayed with other family. I eventually just moved back to the college I was with. I stayed with some of my frat brothers. I just, but I was kind of lollygagging, not doing anything. Then I came back. I worked and lived with my mom for a while. And I started to just kind of get myself. I was working. I went back to school and then I got my degrees. So, you know, now I've got my, I've got a bachelor's in business administration. I've got an associate in legal studies. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I always knew I was a pretty smart guy. I just needed the right time to do it. I needed the right space to do it. And I did it. Um, I still had bad situations with my dad. So that situation was there. And a lot of what pushed me was a real dislike for him. Now I'm like, you know what? prove you wrong. And he's not like he said that you couldn't succeed or anything, but he damn sure didn't say anything to me when I failed. So in my head, and maybe it's just what I needed. It's like, I'm going to do this because I even had a situation where I come back and my parents didn't talk to each other, but they found a way to talk to each other once because they could see I was just in a bad place. And like, listen, we're going to help you. My dad's, I'm going to give you money, go to college, do what you got to do. And I'm like, all right. That lasted a semester. The next semester when I'm like, all right, school's coming up. I need money to pay. And he's like, I never said I was going to do that. So Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, so that's just a whole other reason I didn't trust him. And at that point, I was so upset 
I was so upset. The, I, I don't think I've ever had so much momentum as that moment where I'm like, F you, you did say that. You lied to me again. I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. And I did it on my own without his help. I was, I don't think I've ever been as motivated except now as a family man. But to get stuff done, to be like, you know what? I didn't need your help anyway. And it was really a lot of like, I didn't even need you to tell me anything back then because it wasn't real. I needed me to do it. I needed me to be motivated and you did it. So in a way I needed you, but not in the way the father should. And I'm like, all right, this is it. I went to school, I got my degrees, I'd got my job and I was working and you know what? I was taking care of myself, which for me, I was happy with because I was worth it because I was good enough to take care of myself. And I did. And I got better with time. My relationship with my mom was always good. So I always had her in my corner. But as a black man just trying to deal, sometimes I just gotta, you just gotta go out there. You just gotta deal with these things yourself. You gotta go through these hard moments. You gotta go through these struggles. And I went through the struggle. I had my lows and you know, when you get that first apartment and you're struggling, you could just about pay the rent and you know, you got like two, three pieces of furniture, but you know what? That's my furniture. That's my apartment. That's my check. That's me. I'm doing it and I'll be able to eventually take care of somebody else and do better. So for me, it was just this. You were not good for me then. You pushed me to do something I didn't want to do. You did it again. And this time you're not going to make me fall. I'm not going down. I'm not going to even consider ending anything. This is the beginning of something better. And that's really what it was. It's now what? And from then on, and not that I ever wanted to talk to him, but every decision, every night I didn't want to study. Uh-uh. Nope. No, no, no. That's probably what he thinks I'm doing. Nope. I got work to do. I got stuff to do. I had motivation. I had extra gas in the tank so that I'm going to get this done, which just made me a better person and ready to live. So for me... I wish I had a better, you know, I wish a more colorful, amazing story, but it's just me just gliding by until I got that proverbial kick in the back, in the backside to get to business. And then I finally got to business so that I was ready to meet my wife and be, per, be part of a family of a greater situation. So that's what happened. Then I met her, we're working, I'm just in love love at first sight we get together and it was quick it was just a problem <laughs> it was a problem i saw her and then we didn't even work the same schedule but then we still then we were on the same team then we worked the same schedule and i got to know her and she's got she had two kids and i didn't have any kids and i'm like oh my i love her and i'm gonna meet these kids and i love these kids and all these things and it was just quick boom boom life is coming right look and it's like once i was ready life was like all right let's go the train jump mm -hmm. on it and let's go met her kids we get together and i haven't really thought about it much because i i didn't have time to really think about the mental health thing because i feel like i was just there mm -hmm. i was just good i was i was happy i'm like i didn't have to consider why are you feeling this way because i'm good mm -hmm. and then we did a podcast like i don't know if i mentioned this to you so when covid hit me and my wife we have a podcast called love is black we do a podcast together a black love podcast. We're just talking about black love because it's always looks so bad. Every black love looks like a Tyler Perry movie and all these shenanigans and all this stuff. I'm like, we're not going to do that. This is black love. We love each other. We have kids. We disagree on things, but we can talk like adults. And after doing that podcast, we're on season five now, but after doing this, doing this podcast for a while, I'm like, you know what? You know who could really use something like this is men. Mm -hmm. So I created Men Are the Prize. It's just a space. Because I needed somebody to talk to or somewhere to talk when I was going through my things. And it would have been difficult, but it's even harder now because even talking is not, just talking is not comfortable. It's, it's, it's hard for us men to talk about things because it's not what we're supposed to do. We're not really raised for that. I'm here to just take care of you or to make sure that you have this or you have that or the kids have this or they have this game to play or this phone to, to use. I'm not here to take care of myself. And I'm like, I needed that. And there's a bunch of other men who needed it too. So the man you have now is a man who recognizes what I needed, what other men need now. And I can talk to them and I can coach them because I went through this. Mm -hmm. I struggled with this. I still do. Just because I'm older doesn't mean these issues don't come up. Just like you were saying, these things still happen. But you know, now they're not crippling. 
It's a yeah. temporary moment. I can deal with it and I can keep it moving. And once I talk to men and let them know that life is a series of tough moments, but it's not all of your life. It's just small moments. We deal with it however we have to, and then we keep it moving. I want to talk about vulnerability because you mentioned this word when you were describing the podcast, your podcast, Men Are the Prize. And as I've been reflecting and preparing for this interview, I think a lot about what kind of space I create or if I create space for the Black men around me to be vulnerable. And because for me, vulnerability is letting ourselves be seen so that we can process, so that we can be seen, so that if I have needs like affection or attention or um, a compliment, or if I needed to be held accountable um, in a loving way, or you know whatever the thing is, if I need to be motivated, that there are people in my life who will know that about me. And I really started with vulnerability and willingness to be vulnerable at the point where I stopped drinking and started with AA. And that was 11 years ago now. And around that time, I was able to build my sister circle who are a group of Black women. I was also able to cultivate relationships with people in recovery. And similar to you, my husband just kind of fell in my lap at this time that apparently God thought I was ready. I didn't think I was ready, but God did. And it was also at work. And he'll say that he saw me and he knew. So, but anyways, I didn't even, I didn't notice him like that, but okay. <laughs> um, but at any rate, so vulnerability and willingness for me have been critical in being able to establish a community of support, whether or not I'm going to use professional help or medications or meditation or any of the other things, I heal best in community with other people. And I found that I can't have walls. Um, in these friendships, if I want these friendships to be helpful to me. And if I want to be able to reciprocate in these friendships, then I can't have walls. So I wonder what role has vulnerability played in your life as you've taken this journey um, of mental wellness and of awareness as to your mental wellness and, and as you're talking with men on your show, where is vulnerability coming up? Vulnerability for me is, is this, it's a long string in my story and I'm going to, I'll explain it in a weird way, but it's something that black people, I think some can connect with. So since I grew up in the eighties and told you kind of music I listened to, and I lived in a pretty nice neighborhood. So there weren't a lot of people who looked like us in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So that's why the music that I listened to didn't, it wasn't particularly black per se. So because of at that- At all, it wasn't black at all. It wasn't at all. So I wasn't telling anybody that I was listening to Def Leppard or Bon Jovi or whatever. And because of that, I didn't feel black when I was a teen. Yeah. So because of that, I didn't really show anybody who I was and so I'm listening to music, but the music is low. I wasn't a typical black kid. I loved hip hop, but I wasn't that kid who loved hip hop with the, you know, the boom box on his shoulder or listening to stuff. I listened to everything, but I felt embarrassed if I wasn't listening to what they were listening to and didn't feel comfortable enough to let them know. So I wasn't vulnerable then. One, I wasn't vulnerable at home in terms of just my life. But in, time, in terms of the stuff that I love, the music, the movies and stuff, since there was nobody I related to, there was nobody I could be vulnerable with. I kind of grew up 
without being vulnerable. And that was stagnant for me also, because then of course that led to why I tried to kill myself. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have anybody to be vulnerable with. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I love baseball. It's my favorite sport. I suck at baseball. I'm tried out for that team year after year and I sucked. And I just, that just sat there like, you know what? I suck. I want to be able to play baseball. I want to be Reggie Jackson or I want to be such and such and I can't do it and there's nobody to talk to. So I'm just sitting there knowing that I, I can't do anything. So another, an opportunity for vulnerability, but it didn't happen. So when I finally got on this path to talk to men who I, who I'm going to say, listen, I know what you're going through. The first thing I do is tell them my story. I am vulnerable. I, to my detriment at times, this is what happened to me at this age. This is what happened to me so that I couldn't be vulnerable with somebody who couldn't give to me, give me back to me. Right. The first thing I did, I coach men. I'm like, listen, first session, I start this same way. And I essentially tell them what happened. Divorce, tried to kill myself, blah, blah, blah. And this is where I am now. And I'm like, this, that, this is my story. What's yours? After I've told you what I've gone through. So you can kind of see yourself in my situation. Vulnerability is what allows me to do this. I have to open up because if I, if I don't open up, I can't expect you to. And especially for us black men, we are raised to be something, to do something as opposed to be ourselves. So it's hard. This is just what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to take care of you. I'm supposed to buy these things, do this. I'm supposed to be a man. You, everybody's telling me how, how to be a man and all this stuff. So I don't have time to be vulnerable because I don't have time to feel anything. And if yeah. I do, who's listening? If I do, who's listening? Who cares? So when I talk to these men, I'm listening. I know what you're going through. I care. And I'll, I understand when this happened to you and you handled it this way, when you could have handled it this way, when this person said this to you and you, and you handled it the way society expects you to, but you could have handled it this way. When somebody said something to you and they poked, they triggered you, and you could have, and you responded the way society expects you to, but you could have just walked away. You had these situations. I'm vulnerable because then I'll give you an example. I had one of the guys that I coached and he was telling me how he went to see a therapist. And when you go to see a therapist, that's another thing I talk to men a lot. If you've decided and you've taken that step, I'm going to go find somebody to talk to. You find the one that works for you. Doesn't mean it's the first one or the second or the fifth or the sixth. You find the one you relate to. This one guy I was talking to, he, a brother, went to a therapist, white therapist. He got there like five, 10 minutes late. And he apologized. I'm so sorry. I parked late. I got here. But on my way here, there was a cop behind me and I didn't know what to do. Ooh. The therapist was like, oh, what are you worried about? Did you get stopped? Did you get pulled over? No, but he was behind me for the longest time. and I didn't know what to do. And at that moment, he knew that was not the therapist for him. Mm -hmm. At that moment, mm -hmm. because that therapist, while he's white and probably is well-regarded and knows his stuff, he didn't know that Black man. He didn't understand that as a Black man, and I know it, if it would have been me and he came in and I was driving and this cop was behind me, I got you. I understand. When I drive and there's a cop behind me, there's a fear that people don't get. There is a... What, what's going to happen? If he gets stopped, what am I going to do? Where's my wallet? Where's my license and registration? Where are my hands? Am I going too fast? What's he going to think? All this stuff going through his head. That person, I related to him. That therapist, no clue, had no idea. Thera it's, that's another thing. When I talk to him, I'm like, you got to find somebody who relates to you who understands mm -hmm. you. And I'm like, I understand you so well. I get it so well. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I'm sorry that you got to a therapist who, while they're fine, they just weren't fine for you. Yeah. So that's where vulnerability is, man. It's important. I got to know that the person I'm talking to knows what I'm going through. Yeah. Do you have fear around vulnerability anymore? Not anymore. Not anymore. I... I doing this and coaching men and talking about stuff, I'm really comfortable with this. Every time I talk, I probably gave up too much information now, but when I do these podcasts, I'm like, this is me. 
Yeah. You gotta know me. This is, I, I can, I'm more comfortable talking about me when it's all out on the table. I don't have time to hide anything. I did that for 30 plus years. I don't have time for that now. Yeah. Do you find that men that you're speaking to struggle with the vulnerability? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. We, there's two big things. When I talk to men, we're talking about making money to provide and wanting to start a business. And we're talking about relationships. We are so programmed to just rub dirt on it, dirt, rub dirt on it and keep it moving. Right. That the idea of talking about something is so foreign that I got to work with you. And almost every man, sadly, everyone, and I've, and I've really determined this, that when you are a man in a relationship, and for this sake, since I'm hetero, I'm just going to say I'm speaking about heterosexual relationships. Men will give that woman one shot. They'll be together. They'll do a thing. But they will open up. They will crack open their heart once. And that's telling you something terrible that happened, maybe even shedding a tear and just letting you in. And how that situation goes. How that experience happens will determine the rest of the relationship. So I've got men who I was telling this woman what happened to me when I got stopped as a teenager and the cops and whatever, or what happened to me with a bad relationship with my with my mom and whatever. And I told her because I thought this was my thought this was the one. Three months later, we're arguing, and she's like, and that's why you little when when the cops pull you over, or blah blah blah. That's what happened. That's why your mom and whatever. Ooh. And he's done. It's over. He is done. He is absolutely done. Men, it is hard enough for us to be vulnerable. It is worse for it to be thrown in our faces. Right. So with these men who come to me and they're like, I, and they'll just tell me, told her. And I didn't really want to, but I felt really comfortable at that time. We were sitting there, we're talking. She had just told me about something that happened to her. And I felt really comfortable. And I'm like, this, this is my girl. We about to, we about to do big things. Let me let her in on something. So he'll let her in about this moment, or he'll let her in about this, about this business opportunity, about this dream that he has, something he wants to do. That while it may sound stupid to somebody else, it should sound amazing to my girl because that's my girl. Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Oh wow, baby, I can't believe you're going to do that." And what's the plan? And then th four months later, and that's why that business plan didn't work because it was dumb because you blah blah blah. And it's mm -hmm. you might you might as well just get you might as well just move. Because you lost that man. You may have the body, but you lost his soul. These mm. men, it's it's sad. I spent a lot of time breaking that down. A lot of time saying, I consider self-care is a big thing. Obviously, it's the it's the phrase right now. And I've yeah. said to men that right now, real good self-care is finding somebody who loves you the way you need to be loved. Self-care is hobbies and mindful writing and working out and doing these things. But self-care literally means taking care of yourself. And what better way to take care of yourself than find somebody who loves you the way you need it, who knows to push you a little bit when you need it, who hugs you when you don't even know you need one, stuff like that. And these men are just like, I tried. I did it. Did you find somebody who loved you? Did you make sure she fit did she, the list? You have a list of stuff. Can you tell her anything? Will you listen to her? Do you know how to communicate with her? Does she know how to communicate with you? Does she know when you're feeling, when you're down and you're about to be upset and she's like, baby, go. Does she know you like that? There's so much. So if I can break, listen, vulnerability means sometimes putting your heart on the line and hoping it doesn't get stepped on. That's love. You got to be out there and sometimes it doesn't work. But you'll appreciate that it works because it didn't work sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. you gotta just get hurt. But when that girl, when that woman hears you and it's like, I see the dream, I see what you're gonna do. And she's talking with you about it. In five years, baby, we gonna be going on trips, cruises, we are gonna be celebrating because of the work you did. And baby, I'm so proud of you and I got you. When you get that, you'll appreciate it when you didn't get it. So I have to talk to them, but I know it hurts. I know it sucks. I've been through it, but you'll appreciate it when you get it. But you have to do it. You have to open up. You have to open up. You got to give her a chance. You got to give you a chance. We can't be trapped in this, man. We got to get out. And when you and I've really determined when you get a man who is motivated, who sees what he wants, when he has who he wants, when he feels 
good in a situation, I'm done. I can back up. A motivated, secure man does not need anybody. He is off to the races. Nobody can stop him. That's what I'm trying to get. We have millions of men who just need to get there. Mm. Once we get past vulnerability, we're on that path. Yeah. Wow. So share with us, because we're going to wrap up here in a second. What is So what is your message to Black men? So it, there's a lot. But if you, I don't know if you've listened to the podcast, I end my podcast the same way typically, because a big issue for me, obviously, is I made my attempt to end my life and I didn't. And there's a lot of men out there who don't feel valued, who don't feel loved, who don't feel like there's a reason to be here. So my mantra to every man is basically this. Life is hard. We get kicked in the butt. We struggle. But that's what life is. But what's most important to you is that you need to value yourself. You need to know how important you are. And if you don't think at times that you aren't valuable to yourself, I always say that there's somebody else. You get up and you go to work. There's somebody who's waiting for you to walk through the door who loves to see you come in because you're smiling, you're happy. You got a joke for them. You have to talk about the episode of that show that you watched or whatever. Somebody is so happy to see you come in. Somebody is so happy to hear your voice. Somebody is so happy to debate something with you. You make somebody else's day by your sheer existence. Brother, you are so important. You are so valued as a spouse, as a father, as a best friend. There's somebody whose day is better. There's somebody who was about to make a bad decision but didn't because you walked in and you were happy. You see that Knicks game yesterday? Are you so happy and you talking? You just brought that person's light back out. You are important. You are. You are so valued. So you got to stick around, brother. We need you to keep the family going. We need you to keep the community going, to keep the state going, to keep the world going, to keep everything. We need you. You have, you have innovation. You have a hug to give to somebody. You have a kiss to give to somebody. There's a kid who's waiting for that motivation. You can do it. There's a kid waiting to say hi, daddy. There's a kid. There's someone who loves you. Don't take that away from them. And I say that because you are a wonderful man. You're a human being, which means you're going to make mistakes, but you are a man, you are awesome, and you are the prize. And that's why wow. I mean, that's that's every episode, every man that I see. You are here for a reason, so you got to stick around. Wow. I hope that the men listening are able to really internalize that message. And for the folks who have men in their life who need to hear this message, share it with them. Thank you so much, Harvey. Can you tell us where we can find Men Are The Prize podcast? So every Saturday, 6 a.m., you can find Men Are The Prize podcast at harveylaguerre.com, H-A-R-V-E-Y, L-A-G-U-E-R-R-E.com. That is my podcast every week. Um, if you want to hear me and my wife yakking, yeah. Feel free to listen to our podcast at loveisblackpodcast.com. For this season, I don't, I think I mentioned this to you, we're just writing a great Black love story. So every, every other week, it's one of us writing a chapter. We've got this one story and we're talking about it. But for previous seasons, if you were to hear us talk about politics, about how we met, have other, fan, have other couples come on. We've had couples... We've had thruples on there. We've had bi couples. We'd have everybody. Love stories are beautiful. Black love is amazing. And we talk about it. If you want to hear those episodes, like I said, loveisblackpodcast.com. But I try to affirm, I try to put something positive out every day, my social media, and you can find all that. Go to harveyleguerre.com and all my social media is that is there. But otherwise, you, you really could just type in Harvey Laguerre, my stuff will come up. And um, if you need if you need a positive word, if you need something, if the day is treating you rough, if you just need something happy, this is generally my this this is my uh, I don't know what my what it is. This is just generally how I am. I have a positive disposition, and if you need that on a random Tuesday as you go through the work week, I'm here for you. Wow! Thank you so much, Harvey. Thank you for having me. Or, thank you for. <laughs> You stole my line. Thank you for I know. having me. I know. I was thinking about how I was going to say, 
that I'm going to be on Harvey's show as well. Yep. And um, so when that airs, I will let folks know. But thank you for joining me on Impostrix Podcast, Harvey. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.